thank you. Um, let's see, how's the best way for me to share this with you all? I'll make it a kiosk custom show. I'm uh, moving right now. I'm in the middle of moving from Blacksburg. That's where Virginia Tech is, uh, our main campus to Arlington. Uh, we have a satellite campus up there. So I'm, I'm back in my typical office, but I took a lot of my AV gear. Uh, so I'm down the screen and trying to work some things out. So I appreciate your patience. Um, but hopefully this all looks really good, sounds good on your end, and we have some fun. And I'm going to do it so that I can see you when I'm presenting. So share screen. All right, you should be seeing my PowerPoint presentation at this point. Is that the case? Looks good. All right, great. All right. So yeah, if anyone in the Zoom space would like to turn on their camera, I'd appreciate it. It allows me to get some visual cues and feedback to know if I'm boring you to death or if I'm saying something exciting and entertaining. And I'll try to you know, belabor that point a little bit more. Um, there's way too much to talk about when it comes to my research um, to just sum it up into an hour. Uh, we've been working on this stuff for, for years. So that's why, again, having that visual feedback helps me understand what to talk about a little bit more. Uh, and I'm going to cut certain things short because, again, we uh, lost a little bit of time in the beginning here. So we're going to talk about affordable housing as an immer immersive energy literacy environment. But before I get into the research side of things, I was asked uh, very nicely to talk about my career because there's a lot of graduate students here, maybe interested in doing some of the things I've done or better understanding what comes after the graduate degree for folks working in the energy space. So to start off, I was born in Binghamton, New York. The White House on the right is uh, the house I grew up in for a majority, or I guess the majority of what I can remember as a child. Um, and right across that red fence is uh, subsidized housing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about subsidized housing in a minute. I got an interesting Twitter comment that I haven't got a chance to get back to about this talk. Um, and I'm gonna actually ask the crowd a little bit for uh, suggestions of how to respond. I, I think it, it might be like my first Twitter troll incident. I've never had this before. Uh, so maybe you guys can give me some advice. Uh, Moved from Bingham to New York, down to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to do middle school and high school. Uh, after high school, I was really thinking about going to Cornell. Didn't have the opportunity to do that. I didn't take SAT subject tests. I didn't even know what they were. They were required. Didn't really have the best guidance at the time. Um, did really well in the SAT, but not the subject test. Um, so I ended up going to Clemson. It was the best financial opportunity for me and a great engineering institution, and then worked my way to Virginia Tech in the position I'm in now. So a little bit more about myself. As a civil engineer, I hold safety, uh, public safety paramount. This is not the newest version of the ASC Code of Ethics. This is just a version that I really like um, because it just so greatly puts people first, particularly their lives, safety, health, and then that welfare piece, right? What does it mean to live a high quality life, especially when you're dependent on so much infrastructure that becomes more and more complex. And as if, if you've been paying attention to the news, we're definitely a very divided uh, co country currently, and it's been that way before. So looking at how the engineering judgments I make and that other engineers that I potentially train or work with impact the lives of communities is really, really important to me. All the way on the left, you see I have a big brother. Um, he's about four years older than me, uh, much larger than me. I'm six foot, about 295 right now. I'm a pretty big guy, but he's six foot five and even larger. So I always grew up, you know, connected to people, uh, really confident. Uh, having a lot of fun out there in, in communities, never was really scared to go anywhere. Uh, Binghamton is a really, really cold place. It's right under the snow belt. So we had to deal with a lot of issues related to uh, fuel costs in the winter time. Uh, really love outdoors and cookouts, eating outside, connecting to folks. That's me tearing up a piece of watermelon. Uh, so just letting you know I'm a regular human being. Uh, next picture is me in um, college. 
uh, doing an environmental uh, internship with Santee Cooper. They're a uh, utility provider for electricity, but also they do water work and environmental conservation work. Really, really great opportunity to see so many different things that I could do uh, after college. Uh, next is a study abroad I did in grad school uh, in Italy and looking at uh, some Carrera mining and then also um, looking at some 3D visualization. It's kind of hard to see on this slide, but in high school, my most of my engineering training was related to AutoCAD and visualization. And I got a lot of uh, support to learn how to share visual stories. And it's something that I actually really wanted to do uh, as I got into uh, civil engineering and undergraduate, but I learned very quickly that was a very small piece of the engineering curriculum. Um, I killed the AutoCAD class. I became the youngest TA in the AutoCAD class in Clemson history. They had to do like a special permission for a freshman to train other freshmen in the classroom. Uh, but I learned really quickly, it, it was the physics that was prioritized. It was some of the other things that we really focused on. Um, so I really stopped really training on um, data visualization. Um, and also I wasn't as talented in terms of the artistic piece compared to some others. I was really fast and a, a great technician in the software, but as Joe, uh, yeah, Joe, he said, I can call him Joe today. I'm going to introduce him in a minute. We'll show you some of the visualizations he's creating in terms of the, the creativity and the way they look, the aesthetic. I couldn't do it even if I trained for the next 10 years. Uh, it's, just, it's just not in me. I'm a different type of creative. So I definitely want to say uh, thank you to my high school teacher, Coach Cox, and then also my uncle Dennis, who they both poured a lot of positive energy into me in regards to sharing visual stories to convey uh, civil infrastructure projects. Um, so I also want to talk about kind of just my personal interest and why I chose a career in civil engineering and also focusing in on sustainability, uh, energy efficiency. So you got here the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals and 7.791 billion people to serve. All right. So we have like really, really big challenges we have to face. So you got the engineering grand challenges that you can consider, but the UN Sustainable Development Goals is another great framework to look into. And if you see number seven, uh, you've got uh, affordable and clean energy. Uh, and then number 11 is sustainable cities and communities. Number four, also thinking about quality education. So how does the education piece go into things? Are we building systems that people understand how to use and can be a part of the workforce? We have so many technologies right now that we've developed that not enough people actually know how to operate and maintain. And that's gonna be one of the biggest issues we face with this current um, infrastructure bill is can the people actually build all of these things that we wanna do? Um, and then number 10, I wanted to zoom in on is reduce inequality. So I've lived on multiple sides of the track. I've lived at multiple different socioeconomic statuses. And I can definitely say from uh, personal experiences that it, the life we live and the infrastructure that we have is not equitable at all. And as engineers, we have to take that into consideration and do better. So why become a professor? All right, so you can go out to the field and do all this stuff yourself, uh, make a lot of money, live a pretty great life from what I hear from some of my, my friends. They're like, why are you still at that university? You know, you're, you're there by yourself. You're the only black professor. You're on the tenure track. You're always getting reviewed in certain ways. You're always talking about a paper getting reviewed and like, they're not telling you what's wrong with it. They're just saying it's wrong. Like, you know, what, what, what's this alluring piece to being a researcher and being a professor? When I was coming to Clemson, uh, the first time I actually uh, got the chance to substan spend a substantial time at Clemson was during my summer bridge program. And it was called MEW Math Excellence Workshop. And it really helped me understand how difficult the transition from high school to college was gonna be. I was extremely gifted, so they say, as a high school student. But when I went to Clemson, it was, uh, I was dead in the middle, right? Uh, there was a lot of work I had to do to uh, advance my skill set to be able to compete and do well in the classes that I was gonna take. Uh, after four years, or I think actually six years, the program that brought me in ran out of money. And during grad school, I was also doing a uh, dual 
credit program or certificate program, engineering education, and working with Clemson online, uh, I got a chance to use some of the skills that I was learning at the time to take that summer bridge program and make it a hybrid program. So we could make the program cost a lot less money uh, and be affordable. Every student that came to the program didn't have to pay a thing. Um, we just had to find the sponsorship money to do it. We put it online and I called it Peer Fire. Fire stands for Foundations and Research Experience. And I just wanna say thank you to all these students. I had two cohorts, um, this is one cohort, but watching them develop their researcher identities and understanding what they wanted to do and why they were coming to college really helped me see some of the impact and power that I could have as a professor that I necessarily wouldn't have if I stepped out of academia. I wouldn't get a chance to touch lives the same way. And uh, so I, I really appreciate that. And just seeing kind of the, the rippled impact that I can have and also the lessons that I learned. They the students, the younger students always used to tell me things like, hey, have you thought about building a system this way or building a system that way? And it's just incredible to, to work with the youth and folks who are extremely creative. So let's get into it. Housing as a social technical system. So I'm a researcher. I teach construction classes. I teach uh, sustainable development classes, policy classes. Let me just double check my chat here. OK, I'm good. Um, I really wanted to work on something that was a complex system. Uh, the first idea I pitched in grad school was really simple and it was related to like urinals. And my graduate advisor was looking at me like, why do you wanna work in bathrooms? What does this make any, like, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then I worked it my way to like plastic housing and then other types of like net zero energy housing design to find out while doing my literature review this stuff has been done for years. Like we've had net zero energy housing for an extremely long time. I wanted to do something a little more complex. I wanted to stay practical, but make something more complex. And looking at housing and understanding the social side of it really helped me work on a really uh, advanced problem and understanding it's a social technical system. So here's where I want to do the first little bit of interaction. On Twitter, I want to thank, um, I believe Ali's probably the person who, who tweeted this or maybe someone in her office. Um, there was a pitch for this, uh, presentation. I did a quick drop video just to kind of strum up attention. And I used the word affordable housing. And Climate Cal responded, can you folks please use clear terms like subsidized housing? unless you really do mean abundant and achievable housing. So if you could in the chat, maybe just put what you think uh, affordable housing means. And I know there's some folks in the classroom that can't, they're not on the computer right now. So if Ali or any, Alyssa could share for them. Mm, housing you can afford on a minimum wage income. And I'm going to say it out because this is being recorded. Um, Ali, folks at the Institute, I'm going to actually ask if we can embargo this because some of this stuff isn't published yet. So if we can just pause on releasing it for a little while. But I do, I believe in open access information. I want to get it out to as many people as possible. Um, I just need a little more time to work on a publication. <laughs> yeah, Freddie, we'll work with you to cut out the parts uh, you don't want. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, percent of disposable income below set some threshold. Okay, so we're seeing this 30%. Housing that is accessible to those with limited resources. Yeah, great. Thank you. So that is truly what we're going to talk about. Um, I don't know who they meant by you people. Maybe they're talking about professors. Maybe they're just talking about the Institute. I don't know what UC Davis has said in the community <laughs> up to this point. I know as a community engaged scholar wearing Virginia Tech paraphernalia and representing Virginia Tech when I provide my IRB documents, sometimes I instantly face negative energy because things have gone wrong. Researchers haven't served the community they've extracted from the community. So I understand. Um, but yes, I truly do mean affordable housing. And when I look at um, 
some, some standard definitions, a number is going to pop up and you're going to see it as 30%. So it's 30% of your income spent on your housing. And it gets really, really complex, especially when you start talking about uh, metropolitan areas where the cost of housing is so high and other amenities start getting so high. So that 30% is an ish number. Um, but I truly do mean housing that folks can afford and continue to live a, a high quality of life paying for other parts of life. There's so many other things to do. So with that being said, we've got that tweet. I appreciate some of the uh, statements that are being said here in the chat. I'll try to use them to formulate a response to this tweet. Uh, let's wash away anything we'd like to let go. If there's any negative energy in the room and folks are kind of feeling triggered from something that was said to them on Twitter before, we're gonna just let that go. So one of the main research questions I'm going to highlight here, uh, and Joe's going to help me illustrate in a moment, is how interaction with energy efficient home design features can uh, impact energy literacy. So what I specialize, one of the things I specialize is, is looking at affordable energy uh, efficient homes. And if we don't have the affordability limitation in there, we can make some really phenomenal housing with all types of gizmos to make it net positive or regenerative. Uh, but when you add that affordability piece into it, it does become pretty complex in terms of providing uh, a housing that is gonna be net zero energy or uh, highly efficient. So I look at embedded energy lessons. So uh, essentially the Department of Energy developed an energy literacy guide around uh, 2012. Uh, and it does connect to next generation science standards. The project Joe's gonna highlight, we are co collaborating with a local high school to meet some science standards um, and also computer science standards. Look at influential design elements. So what parts of the home and what parts of our design should we really be thinking about to help people understand energy and energy systems? What types of interactions? So here I have uh, a comic. I really like educational comics. Uh, and the thermostat says uh, guilty and not guilty. So it's like when you're making that decision of, okay, am I going to impact the environment negatively just to be a little bit more comfortable or I'm, am I going to impact maybe my household's cost? So fuel poverty is a, is a very real thing for many people in America and many people across the globe. So am I going to be guilty for harming, whether it be my environment or uh, my financial situation? And then lastly, the adoption of knowledge. Okay, how can we work together? So I put gears there to show that people have different roles and we all need to work together. Like we don't want just the affluent people in the world to have enough money to be spending quickly towards sustainability and living high quality lifestyles and leaving other folks behind, all right? But we also don't want that to happen to where it, it happens at the expense of some other uh, different people. All costs should be included in affordability, including energy costs, so that net zero could make sense. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to take a walk. We're going to talk about how and why energy literacy must be improved, the interdisciplinary approach, exploring the case studies, specific energy lessons discovered, and some implications. All right, so again, this comes from the DOE. I actually should update the citation. They made some slight changes to this guide, I believe, in 2015 or 2017. Um, and I'll get into the specific competencies in a, in, a, in a minute. They have seven different principles. And I actually got a chance to talk to some of the folks who developed this. And it was interesting to hear that since so many people were in the room, they actually didn't come to a common agreement. So one thing for the grad students I want you to realize is you guys are going to be the ones who get a chance to be in the room and make certain decisions on what do we consider energy literacy to be? These are all humanly designed or decided decisions. And you know sometimes it's the loudest person in the room wins or who's got the most leverage. Uh, but just realize, again, hopefully you can work towards being someone who makes uh, these type of principles or guidelines reflect what society needs. And I won't get into diversity and inclusion in STEM. We all know it's not inclusive enough. It's not diverse enough. So again, definitely do what you can to pitch in on that and make sure that if you are someone from an underrepresented group, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but do leverage your position to make sure that you're sharing for the folks that you also do represent and connect with. So 
I mostly focus on five different energy literacy concepts. We found a few others in homes, but we're trying to really lean in on the data that we have the most of, and also the things that we can say are most valid, that our participants truly say like, hey, this is embodied in our house. So just because I can see it as an en engineer, and someone who really studies energy literacy all the time, that doesn't mean that's truly what uh, society connects with. So until I can actually see that connection and say that, okay, uh, a general person can go inside of an energy efficient home and see this lesson, I don't include it. So electricity can be uh, generated in multiple ways. Uh, energy conservation is one way to conserve uh, energy resources. Um, oh, sorry, the first one is <laughs> energy use is subject to limits and constraints. So, okay, uh, we can only use photovoltaic energy in certain areas of the country at certain times. And then also getting to energy uh, can be generated in multiple different ways. Um, energy use can be uh, monitored and calculated. So essentially when I was doing my PhD, you're gonna get, there was this really cool study by Shazin Atari um, from, I'm pretty sure she was coming from a public policy standpoint. And they gave a bunch of surveys and essentially we noticed that, or they noticed that as uh, energy use went up and also saving opportunities went up, people's perceptions were off the line. So what this graph is showing you that is that central air conditioners, people underestimate how much electricity they use. And then they also underestimate how much savings could be uh, obtained by making a behavioral change. So what that means is we really need to focus our energy specifically when we're talking about the design of these buildings on the things that make the most sense and have the biggest impact. So culturally, specifically in the black community, there's a lot of language around a light bill. And because at one point in time, incandescent bulbs were a really big part of your electricity bill. That is not the case anymore. Most utilities actually, or many utilities actually provide LEDs uh, for free to folks because it makes that big of an impact. And essentially, I don't tell people to do this, but you could almost just leave your lights on and not make much of a big difference in your overall electricity bill, especially if you have uh, energy efficient, uh, energy inefficient HVAC or um, dryer. Okay, so one thing we're highlighting is that when we're designing these homes, smart homes don't need smart occupants, they need literate occupants. I like to think people are extremely smart, but uh, if you look at the data around energy literacy, there's a lot of high school questionnaires that they put out, you'll see that energy literacy is actually extremely low across um, uh, many different populations. But I've also asked some certain specific energy literacy questions to my engineering classroom. So folks who are juniors in um, civil engineering or even grad students in civil engineering, and they don't know some basic principles about energy. So that goes ahead and lets you know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to inform people and make all folks literate. So I like to say that the home is a new face for energy. Uh, here on the left, you have a picture of a standard power plant, and then on the right, you have a rendering of a power plant they built in Copenhagen, and they did this on purpose to make it a ski slope to make energy more inviting, people could interact with it, and then at the top of the ski, sco ski slope, they actually put out some steam, so on the left, most of that you're seeing out of the power plant is actually steam, and people think it's negative emissions, but it's actually steam. Uh, but again, most people can't get a chance to have a power plant like this. And many people can get a chance to live in an energy efficient home. So I like to say, if we can show them, if they can see the same infrared vision I see when I look at a house that has leaks or cracks or inefficient windows, that's gonna help them better understand energy. And how can we do that? So did exploratory case studies across the nation. The one we're gonna focus on, uh, I guess really on the East Coast, haven't done too much on the West Coast other than the solar decathlon um, is, in Greenville. So there's some pretty good solar potential and that's gonna come in in a minute while we chose that. Uh, for folks who really care about research and research validity, I just, we had a multiple case study design at one point in time for this, uh, for my dissertation work. And this is kind of how I set up my protocol. So if you haven't created a visual for your research, this is what I'm trying to tell you. And hopefully the other faculty advisors here are appreciative of this. 
please draw something out so that your faculty members can see what you're trying to do, at what points you're going to analyze the data, when, if you're going to say you're going to do a mixed method study, when are you going to mix the data together, all right? When are you going to analyze one thing versus another? And it, it, it really helps. So all those paragraphs that you write in your dissertation, if you can't put it into a visual like this, you're probably going to lose a few folks. Peggy's house. Um, so here's the house originally when I started working on it. And I talked about solar potential because they picked this uh, location because there was high solar potential. At first, they couldn't afford to have solar uh, PV on the project, but it did uh, get installed by a local um, technical college. And that was a great opportunity for the technical college students to get a chance to practice their skill set that they were learning in the classroom. Um, there were a lot of uh, donated um, materials. Uh, they had alternate fuels in there. And it was designed to be a uh, low income housing uh, opportunity. So they hired people from the community and other folks who uh, had low income situations, let them live in the house and then provide them employment opportunities to share with all their neighbors how you could live a sustainable lifestyle. So it's a really, really cool group. I won't say their name yet. I'm still trying to figure out some final IRB things. Um, they've approved that I could share their name and, and put it all out there, but I'm still trying to make sure that the participants who provided me data are protected. And then we also looked at some uh, homes and other communities around Greenville at the same time and uh, essentially just talked to folks at lower income levels in affordable housing units. So I would say, I think the house on the left hand, bottom left hand corner was the most expensive home. And I believe it was $135,000. And that house actually cost more money than this brand new home, which was $109,000. Now there are some, um, not necessarily subsidies, but donations that went in to make that possible. Um, but again, I'm starting to think about how can we make the system more appropriate so that actually occurs more. At one point in time in society, folks would pitch in to help each other build homes and build community. And then lastly, uh, something more contemporary that we're working on. So here's Joe James. This is his introduction. He is a PhD student in the Style Research Group. Uh, Joe James is from Columbia, South Carolina. He went to Clemson University. He was a formal mechanical engineer, and I taught him some, something to just that makes sense. Switch over to civil. So much better of a major. I'm kidding. Uh, he was really fighting me on that at first, uh, and now he studies data visualization specifically for ener energy data visualization. Um, he really loves visualizations. He, he, he captured this drone footage. He was just in this community uh, this morning collecting more information from the community, and he specializes also in, in, in dashboard design. So right now we're going to talk about his VR work, but he also creates energy dashboards, which are really, really cool. So how do we do this? How do we get the data? So we go in, we put in energy monitors. This is an e-gauge device. Uh, we create Wi-Fi networks so that we can make sure that we can collect the data from the community. And we create a lot of different visualizations for the folks. Here's just some examples of some dashboards. Uh, on the bottom right-hand corner is a GIS version um, of a dashboard. And what that would be provided to, who that'd be provided to is the property manager so they can manage a portfolio. Uh, and just something we were playing around with with a dot density diagram to see uh, how close people were getting towards a budget. So when the block was completely filled, that meant they reached their energy budget. And when it was empty, of course, they still had a lot of space, but just previewing some of the great stuff that uh, Joe does. Um, here's a scientific data paper through Nature that I, I published on this. I don't know why it says uh, preprint. Need to update that on a data set. So I do like, again, believe in open um, access to information. So you can actually pull some data directly from one of our case studies. We spent hours and hours building uh, community connections, connecting with folks. But now you guys get a chance to download and play around with that data however you want to. All right, so on the left is how the building was, and then we got to Electric VR. So Electric VR is Joe's project that he collaborated with the local high school for. Um, this is just a prototype. That's what I'm saying. We're going to embargo some stuff. We're still building this out, but it's designed to help people understand how to collect energy information and uh, do data science on energy, circuit level energy data. Wanted to throw this in here really quick again for the grad students, uh, figuring out how you can um, operationalize some of your work, uh, what kind of data you're going to collect. So here we had survey data, 
we had observation data, we had interview data. When we were surveying, we were asking people what they thought the potential was for a home to teach different uh, principles. Uh, we were looking at uh, different impacts that they think if they learn something about uh, their home and about energy, would it change their behaviors? When we analyzed it, we used descriptive statistics that allowed us to see what was most likely um, to have an impact um, from people's perceptions, observations. So really going in and being in the community and taking field notes, uh, but then also drawing out the community and looking at it from different angles really helped us see what kind of behaviors existed, but also what home features were really, really important. Uh, and then uh, interviews. That's one of my specialties uh, as a qualitative researcher. I'm really good at having conversations and helping folks share a story with me. And then on the back end, analyzing it and making sense out of it. Some examples of my uh, coding process. Uh, I like to do highlights. Uh, I like focus coding, bringing things together to these different categories and buckets. Uh, but if anyone, uh, any of the grad students are really interested in doing qualitative data, please reach out to me. Uh, I love to help folks learn the process and do it the right way because I see a lot of folks go out there and just take data and do descriptive coding on it. And that's really like a low tier level of analysis. And there's so much more in those um, transcripts take, typically that we should work as researchers to uh, get out and share with the people for the people because the folks gave you their time to share their information, to share their story, you should do your best work to make sure it uh, impacts the research uh, community as highly as possible and the overall community as best as possible. A suggestion for doing qualitative research, particularly with interview data, consider using the Q3 framework. It asks you questions throughout the process to make sure that you are um, answering certain validity checks and also reliability checks. This is something that Joe uh, <laughs> has fun with because he's like, these questions are so hard to answer sometimes, but that's the point, right? You work on it and figure out, okay, what theoretical framework am I being, bringing in? So one thing you'll see um, eventually with Joe's career is he's taking people's stories about how they've lived and thought about energy through time and uh, turning it into a dashboard. So if I told you, okay, I see energy related to the way I look at the battery bars on my cell phone, how do you turn that into something that fits on an energy dashboard? Like it's a really uh, complex process, um, but it's very doable. Then again, visualizing the data. So here, the five energy literacy concepts. Again, human use of energy is subject to limits and constraints. Electricity is generated in multiple ways. Energy uh, use can be calculated and monitored. Uh, social, I left this out in the last one, sorry. Social uh, and technological innovations affect the amount of energy used by society and conservation is one way to manage energy resources. And as you see, there's a lot of different things that came out, a lot of different features and it's really small. So I'm gonna get into some detail in a second. Uh, again, this is the framework visualized in a different way. Here are the embedded energy lessons. Here are some inf influential design elements. Uh, passive design features, active design features, the home occupant. So from the, in this study, we started learning that the people matter. And then you'll see that in uh, Joe's VR presentation that uh, he put people in there because they matter. And when you interact with someone, sometimes it's different from just interacting with the building. All right, so um, the concrete and constricting costs demanded by utilities for energy consumption, teach consumers about energy's limits and constraints. So here's a, a uh, excerpt from a uh, interview. As far as costs, I'm trying to knock the bill under a certain amount. So I guess that would be a constraint. And that's something that Joe's going to work on. And how can we visualize on a dashboard, whether it be through animation or other um, design elements, a knocking down of a bill versus just saying, hey, here's your budget. Don't reach this line. We saw that there was some connection between the water energy nexus. So essentially folks could see when something was running in their house, uh, they could tell if a pipe was leaking, et cetera, and they knew their uh, water bill was gonna be higher, but it's really hard to see that energy sipping out or slipping out of your home. So uh, VR and other uh, visual technologies allows us to show that. Over there. Questions in the chat. 
what are the most effective tools for improving energy literacy in rural and underserved communities? That's an extremely loaded question, right? It's like, that's something that you could write a whole dissertation on. Uh, what are the different most effective tools? So my first question, and I like to respond to questions with questions sometimes, what do you mean by effective? Hopefully we can get a response to that or I mean anyone want to tell me what you mean by effective hey Freddie this is Josh can you hear me yeah I can hear you hey so um thanks for asking that actually it's a you know I should have specified um oh, I guess by effective I mean like what um what tools maybe will help them transition to maybe a, more, a, a cleaner uh energy in terms of their household um or maybe just improve their understanding of um you know energy efficient homes and how they can transition. I appreciate that. So originally my hypothesis based on uh, literature at the time, this was around 2013, um, all about education, okay? You teach someone, uh, you whether you go in person or you provide them a pamphlet or you know some videos, people need to know, they need to be literate and then they're gonna make changes. And then uh, environmental psychologists and behavioral economics folks caught up and started providing more information, which was already existing in the literature. It was just a little hidden. And they're like, well, just because someone's educated doesn't necessarily mean they're motivated, right? And when you start tapping into motivation factors, that's when you get into very customized interactions with people, right? So some folks, it's all about the money. Others, and one thing I find a lot, particularly in some of the Black um participants in my study, uh, older Black participants, is eco-spiritualism is a really big thing. So we're trying to figure out how to work with more um, churches and faith-based organizations to see what's going on there. But they talked a lot about a connection between the body, the spirit, um, and the environment, and how no matter what, even if they can't afford it, or even if um, it, it, it's not easily attainable in their mind, they know spiritually they need to be working towards uh, more environmental stewardship and they're willing to do whatever they can to do that. Uh, other things in terms of opportunity. So if I come in as a utility and say, hey, I'm going to provide you a weatherization for free, or if I'm going to provide you, or I'm going to change the, the rates it's going to be more expensive. And then now that that limit and constraint comes in again, right? It's like, I have to change my behaviors because I can't afford it. Uh, so there's a lot of different tools um, or, or levers that we can pull. Uh, some of the most frequent examples that I'm seeing though is uh, related to um, solar energy. When you do put solar PVs in a community, even if it's not on the person's house, they see it, they're outside, they're visible, uh, they're somewhat shiny and black and, and metallic and folks wanna know and they've heard a, a decent bit about uh, solar and sometimes myths and misconceptions come into play, right? You start installing those and people say, oh, now I can do whatever I want in my house, not fully realizing that that system has been optimized to be at a certain budget. And once you go over and now you're starting to cause the same issue. Um, so I would say very visible, visible and tangible examples uh, are really effective. And then social peer pressure. So O Power uh, did a really great job with their um, push to add to utility bills where it starts to compare you between others. The only problem is, is after you start comparing folks to others and they're not doing well, they really want to know what the comparison rules are and what they can do to uh, do better, or they're going to tap out. If you never give them that feedback, well, they're just going to say, hey, this is an unfair competition. I can't win. And they separate themselves from the engagement. Um, let's see. Hopefully that, Josh, that answer your question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Great question. Um, you mentioned that energy use can be calculated, monitored. CPUC just adopted the TSB to value energy efficiency beyond economic energy savings. The TSB is measured in dollars, uh, reflect the life cycle energy capacity and GHC reductions achieved through hourly savings. Wondering 
what your thoughts are on that and how feasible do you think it is to be to measure by dollar so the units of energy are really really important um so every time we go publish a paper as a group we're always thinking like do we want to talk about energy intensity looking at square footage um do we want to talk about dollars to compare do we want to make sure it's, it's really clear about what location we're in because that has a lot of different uh impacts on what's going on do we want to talk about before and after uh some type of um intervention because if the house was already performing at a certain level this new level uh needs to be compared within context um and i mean overall honestly i'm still figuring it out like i am talking to people and trying to figure out can we have a common language around this and the more i engage the less optimistic i am for it i think it should be more of like a, a menu right when you get your bill and that's what joe's specializing in uh, is creating these customized dashboard dashboards is what is going to be the most effective to get people to understand what's going on what terms do you need to discuss this in so as a construction management uh, professor i talk a lot about leadership in the classroom and leadership in engineering um, and motivating others and one of the first things i say in the class around that is like figure out what's going to get that other person to do what they're supposed to do for this team project throughout the semester don't email me saying so and so is not pulling their weight unless you figured out what's going to motivate them and it's not always just getting an a in a course and that's kind of something that people assume that everyone in the class wants to get an a and that's not the truth so over here i would say the same thing it's not always going to be about dollars it's not always going to be about cents it's not always going to be about car tons of carbon or tree saved uh, sometimes it's about bees and wildlife <laughs> other times it's about water sometimes it's about food um so i'm not sure if we're going to get to a, a clear standard um i think dollars do make sense in the beginning but i think with the technologies that we have we could be so far past that we can quickly convert with the computer systems we have on a cell phone data uh within inst within seconds instantaneously and we, we need to take that into consideration um let's see Okay, you asked two questions, so I want to skip really quick. Raymond, when communicating energy literacy to various communities, is there a difference in how you approach your discussion with residents, high density or multifamily unit housing compared to those in lower? Absolutely. It's it's a it's a completely different situation. Honestly, it's a different situation just from community to community. I mean, sometimes, you know, you go down four blocks in a, in, a, in a city and it's a completely different socioeconomic status the houses were built in different times uh so if i'm going to an older house it's it's super leaky it's going to take a lot of work to get it to where it needs to be in terms of energy efficiency i take that into regard if the resident is older or younger i take that into consideration um so i always make uh changes and then i wanted to highlight particularly um the difference between rural and urban settings. So originally I was going to do a lot of my research in an urban setting just because that's what gets more funding, but also I would be honest, ease of research opportunities. I can contact a lot of people in this very dense multifamily situation versus going home to home. So this morning I was with Joe in one of his communities and I was telling him, I was like, man, you got it so easy. We just drove over here, there's parking. We, we got to all these houses in like an hour. For me, I'm walking down super long driveways. <laughs> It's hot, there's gnats outside, all this other type of stuff. Um, so yeah, I take the cultural context into consideration. And I will say that in urban situations, the fat, the fast paced uh, situation in life, but also some of the constraints. So, you know, the housing is going to be what it is. There's not a lot of space to make changes. Um, a lot of times people are renting and that play, plays, a, plays a big role in terms of what can be done. There's a very small margins for, um, making the economic decisions. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some differences. Uh, I wanna go back to Hong because I asked a question early and um, Ali, please stop me whenever um, you talk about this all day. Maybe one more question. All right. Um, so I won't ask answers to Hong's question because I already answered one of those. I think it's the Cali or Kaylee. Hopefully, I'm not butchering that. Turner. Cali. Yep, you got Callie. it. Cali. All right. Have you thought about including the health benefits of improving energy efficiency or even electrifying homes? I'm thinking that in terms of average household spending, medical bills take up a larger percentage than energy bills. So I'm 
I think that in terms of equity would be super impactful. So a project I did with HUD uh, was related to uh, improving the path report done by RAND. It's called Improving Housing Innovation, uh, Building Better Housing. And we did the new version of that recently, like 2017, 2018. And we brought in uh, a lot of healthy housing experts. And that was a big point of conversation. And to short, shorten it, to concisely answer your question, yes, I really care about health. I think it's a, a really great uh, way to get folks motivated. Folks do not want to die or be unhealthy. Uh, there's a lot of conversation right now, particularly around COVID. Uh, like before COVID happened, I already had UV lights and, and, and high, high efficiency filters in my HVAC of my house. And um, I, I'm hoping there's things that can be done to help other folks access that. But before I start adding more dimensions into the competencies that we're sharing, I want to make sure I can figure out this energy literacy part of it. It's already complex enough. Uh, but yes, I agree that health issues are extremely disruptive. And many times when folks answer my question about, okay, what, what will happen if you save more on energy or what are you not paying for because your energy bills are too high and medical bills and medical expenses definitely come into consideration. And then lastly, with all these floods and natural disasters that are becoming more and more impactful, uh, folks who are required, who require certain electrical devices to sustain life, even something as simple as a CPAP machine, right? If you don't have power for weeks on end, uh, that's very, very problematic and people are in danger. And that sometimes gets them more interested in engaging and figuring out what they can do to have more resilient and energy efficient housing. Hopefully that answers you, Kaylee.